Hi, marine ecology students. This lecture is about disturbance ecology. So disturbance is a type of ecological change, but it's not the only type of ecological change. Um, there are different types of ecological change, and so regular cyclic change in the environment is considered fluctuation. Uh, things that happen on a regular basis, like tides, day-night cycles where it goes from light to dark and back again, seasons, and the responses of organisms to those cycles, which we call phenology. And you can see the typical seasonal cycle of a deciduous tree in a temperate zone going from summer to fall to winter to spring and back again. That would be a phenological cycle and an example of fluctuation, a sort of regular cyclic environmental change. And so contrast with that regular cyclic change, a discrete event in time that disrupts ecosystem, community, or population structure, or changes resources, substratum, and the physical environment. Some big uh, singular event that really changes things not on a regular schedule is what we would call a disturbance. So I'm showing an asteroid impact as an example of disturbance. Some other examples of fluctuation versus disturbance. So you can see sort of the regular tidal fluctuations that a marine ecosystem goes through and contrast that with the rare and unpredictable event uh, like a hurricane or a man-made disturbance like an oil spill that would be a, a singular event in time that causes a big environmental change. I'm sorry, my dog is whining in the background. Environmental changes happen at different time scales and different spatial scales. And the spatial scales vary from very small, like uh, microhabitat changes that might affect just one face of a rock, for example, that gets scoured or abraded by another rock. Uh, within habitat changes that might uh, disturb one patch of a seagrass bed, for example. Local disturbances that might affect an embayment or a cove where a lot of uh, seaweed washes up and rots or there's a local anoxia problem. And then there's regional disturbances affecting, for example, an entire coastline, such as a large harmful algal bloom that would affect the entire coastline. There are disturbances that could affect a whole ocean basin, like a unusual climate event like El Nino could affect an entire section of the Pacific Ocean, and then there are global disturbances like an asteroid impact or a major uh, climate event. And the timescales of disturbance can be very brief up to very, very long-term geological, astronomical types of disturbance. And understanding the impacts of the disturbance means we need to understand the spatial scale and the temporal scale that that disturbance is happening at. So these are some examples of natural disturbances in the marine environment. I have natural with an asterisk by it because sometimes human effects will influence and add to these so-called natural disturbances like climate change affects weather disturbances, for example. Uh, the weather disturbances that can affect marine environments include big waves, uh, ocean atmosphere shifts like El Nino and La Nina that change the temperature and nutrient levels and weather patterns in parts of the ocean, hyper and hypo salinity in bays and estuaries related to extreme precipitation or drought, uh, extreme hot and cold water events which can cause coral bleaching or other problems, ice scour in temperate and cold areas that affects uh, shallow and, and intertidal habitats where ice forms on them. Sediment processes like burial and erosion can affect benthic life it's, if it's uh, ripped out of the sediment by erosion or smothered by burial. Harmful algae blooms like red tide can have direct toxic effects or they can lead to low oxygen events like anoxic and hypoxic events. There can be disease outbreaks like the plague that killed sea urchins in the Caribbean in the early 1980s. And species die-offs can be a disturbance as the effects of one species being gone ripple through the food web. And one uh, another type of disturbance is variable recruitment, leading to extreme high or low abundance of key organisms in the food web. If there's a very large recruitment event and the ecosystem is flooded with an abundance of organisms or a very small recruitment event and organisms that are usually present are absent, that can be a disturbance that ripples through the rest of the food web.
Here are some examples of man-made disturbances, anthropogenic disturbances in the marine environment. So direct physical disturbance is easy to understand when humans do something that stirs up the seafloor, such as trawling or dredge fill operations, or we build over and destroy coastal habitats with construction that directly physically disturbs the environment. Overfishing is a disturbance both because of the direct effects of messing up the sea bottom and removing fishes and also the trophic cascade. So when species are gone, their ripple effects through the food web constitute a disturbance. Climate change and acidification, effects of carbon dioxide pollution, those are disturbances in themselves and they exacerbate natural disturbances like by making the severity of hurricanes worse and causing coral bleaching events due to heat waves to become worse and more frequent. Pollution and eutrophication, which is nutrient pollution, um, those, are, those are serious types of uh, disturbances. There can be toxic effects of the pollutants and the overstimulated algae from nutrient pollution can cause uh, harmful ripple effects. And then there's this sort of biological pollution as well where we introduce non-native species to the environment and they wreak havoc and upset the food webs. So there's a term called disturbance regime and that refers to the frequency, magnitude, and type of disturbances that a particular ecosystem experiences. So it's a little bit tricky to understand because just by definition disturbances are irregular. They're not really uh, on a regular schedule. But if you look on for a long period of time, you can find out the approximate frequency of disturbances of different types and, and how bad they are. And the characteristics of an environment will be determined largely by its disturbance re regime, meaning like what kind of disturbances it has on what sort of time scale of recurrence. Uh, and all ecosystems experience some natural disturbance. It's just a matter of degree. Some are severely disturbed on a relatively frequent basis. Others experience infrequent and minor disturbances. And the picture here is from a sort of a model of disturbances in a forest environment where it shows four different kinds of disturbances and over a time scale of 200 years, which is relevant to forests since trees live for hundreds of years, you can see where different major disturbances have happened. And so in an environment like a forest where it might take some of the trees 200 years to reach maturity, if you have tree killing disturbances happening on less than a 200 year time scale that would you know really change what the forest looks like so the disturbance regime of an environment can have a very strong effect on what type of species you'll find in that environment so let's consider different marine ecosystems and what kinds of disturbance regimes they might have first we'll consider some examples of marine ecosystems that experience frequently frequent disturbance, and others that experience less frequent disturbance. So shallow water intertidal environments are frequently disturbed because they're affected by waves from the surface, storms, and other things that affect the shallow waters of the ocean. Estuaries are very frequently disturbed because they're subject to rapid and large fluctuations in salinity levels, for example. Storm-exposed coasts can be hit by storm waves, and coastal areas tend to be disturbed by humans a lot too because they're heavily trafficked with boats. There's a lot of construction and pollution and trawling on the, the seabed there, so coastal ecosystems, particularly near large human habitations, are frequently disturbed. And then there's some marine ecosystems that are rarely disturbed by natural or man-made influences, like the deep sea environments, rarely disturbed, open ocean pelagic environments, it's a little harder to disturb them since they don't have a benthic component, and some Arctic and Antarctic environments because they're so consistently cold and protected by an ice cover year round, they are less disturbed and also there is less human disturbance up there. So the amount of disturbance that you have in the environment can really be seen in what type of communities of life forms develop in that environment. So in a shallow continental shelf in a wave-exposed area, you'll have this 
seabed that looks pretty barren because it's regularly scoured by storm waves and strong tidal currents and you don't see a lot of slow growing long-lived species sticking up out of the seabed there because they would be swept away before they would reach that mature size whereas if you're in a deeper area that's less frequently disturbed you can have the development of more elaborate communities of slow growing organisms like corals and sponges so ecosystems are drastically altered by disturbance. The populations of certain organisms can go down, or other organisms, their populations might go up after a disturbance. And because the disturbances affect different organisms differently, the communities of multiple species in the ecosystem are changed by the disturbance. And even the physical features of the environment can be changed by the disturbance. One general theme with disturbance, though, is that uh, disturbance, at least heavy disturbance, <coughs> decreases biodiversity and habitat structure, usually. So there are some characteristics of ecosystems that affect how they respond to disturbance, and there are two words for those characteristics of how ecosystems respond to disturbance, and they're similar words, resistance and resilience, yet they mean each means something a little bit different. Resistance describes how well the ecosystem resists the disturbance, meaning how little it changes from its original state, whereas resilience refers not to resisting change, but to recovering rapidly from change. So if the ecosystem is resilient, it may be affected, but it will be a short-term effect because it will recover quickly. So we need to consider both the, the resistance and the resilience of ecosystems. <clears throat> Let's think about what properties of an ecosystem might make it more resistant to disturbance, uh, less affected by disturbance. So strong biogenic structures that can resist the disturbance effects, like massive stony corals or big mangrove trees and seagrasses with their roots fir firmly attached in the substrate, those will be able to sort of keep the ecosystem physically in place and, and resist a disturbance. Large, healthy populations of hardy organisms, if populations are high to begin with and the organisms are not stressed, they will be less likely to be affected by a disturbance. And if there's high biodiversity, including species that are not very affected by whatever the disturbance is, then that means that the overall ecosystem won't show the signs of disturbance as much. It'll be more resistant. And then let's also think about the properties of an ecosystem that could make it more resilient after disturbance, more able to recover. So uh, the properties of an ecosystem that make it more resilient are in some ways a little bit different than the ones that make it resistant. So quick growing, quick reproducing species are more resilient to disturbance. So they doesn't mean that they won't be affected by the disturbance. It means they'll be able to respond and recover quickly after the disturbance. And if they're able to recruit to the disturbed ecosystem from nearby undisturbed areas, that can help the disturbed area recover faster. And like uh, the properties that increase resistance, high biodiversity is also a property of ecosystems that can help increase their resilience. So high biodiversity increases resilience because in a highly diverse community, you're likely to have species that are able to recover quickly. So let's look more at this recovery process. So after a disturbance, the ecosystem can recover all the way back to its undisturbed state, but it doesn't happen instantly. It's sort of through a succession of different stages of recovery. So there's like the early stage and the later stage. You can kind of think of this like how uh, your body would recover from a wound. Initially you bleed and then a scab forms and then uh, it heals and scar tissue forms and then eventually it sort of goes through different stages of healing. And ecosystems have this succession of stages of recovery that's somewhat similar. It's also possible though that the ecosystem may not return to the same state after a disturbance as it was before the disturbance. Um, we call this uh, alternative states. So uh, a disturbance can actually shift one type of ecosystem to a completely different type of ecosystem. A good way to understand the stages of recovery after disturbance is with this terrestrial example, because we can see this with our eyes as we drive around or walk around 
um, disturbed landscapes on land. So initially there's a disturbance. It could be something like a forest fire or a forest that gets logged or a lawn that's abandoned. Some sort of environment without much vegetation is created and then it's colonized initially by opportunistic species, species with windblown seeds that can root in loose soil and can rapidly grow. So things like weeds, dandelions, um, those so-called R-selected species or opportunistic species would be the first to settle in the disturbed areas and begin to get a foothold. But then as time passes, those early colonizers can be overgrown and replaced by competitively superior species like uh, larger plants and bushes and shrubs. Uh, and then in turn, those mid-sized species can be overgrown and shaded out by um, trees that grow well in, in sunny habitats like uh, pines, for example. And But then even those first generation trees will ultimately be replaced by more shade tolerant trees that can grow up from the understory and eventually shade out the first first trees in that environment. So the eventually what you get is called a climax community which is dominated by the competitively superior species. It's just that it takes you have to go through all those stages to get to that. So let's look at some ocean examples of the types of species that you might find right after a disturbance, the early successional are selected species, and the types of species that you might find later on in a community that's had time to reach its climax state. So the early successional are selected species, they have to be able to survive in a recently disturbed habitat. So they can't be dependent on any kind of other species being established. They have to be good pioneers. And usually they live fast, die young, produce many offspring, and have long-range dispersal because their offspring need to be able to find some other recently disturbed environment to survive in because you know they're not going to be able to compete for long in an environment that has hasn't recently been disturbed. So they tend to have small body size, weak defenses against herbivores or competitors, and, and, and they're, they're weak competitors against other organisms, so they can be crowded out. An example from Caribbean reef environments is the fleshy red alga, Asparagopsis taxiformis. After Hurricane Irma swept a lot of the algae and sessile invertebrates off reefs in the Caribbean, this algae became abundant in some places and was later displaced. Okay, so let's look at the late successional K-selected species. These would be things like large stony corals like boulder brain coral, Copophilia natans. They're dependent on a habitat that's stable and uh, uh, they're less likely to colonize recently disturbed habitats. They can't grow on soft loose sediments, for example. Uh, they grow very slow, they live long, and because they're good at crowding out other organisms given a long time to do it, they can uh, dominate and outcompete others in the area. They have big bodies, strong defenses, and in the long term they're competitively superior even though it takes them a long time to ramp up to their dominant state. So let's look a little deeper at some of the adaptations of uh, early successional R strategists versus late successional K strategists. So the our strategists, these early colonizers of disturbed habitats, the earliest colonizers of all would be the microorganisms. They very rapidly reproduce and colonize areas. Then the next size of organisms up from microorganisms are myofauna, um, including nematode worms, copepods, little creepy crawlies that live down in the sediments, and then small macrofauna like polychaete worms and crustaceans like amphipods also grow and reproduce pretty quickly, so they would colonize an area relatively quickly as well. Uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum you have larger infauna, things like clams that take a long time to grow, slow-growing sponges and corals, some of them, and particularly deep-sea corals and sponges, are very slow-growing indeed, and they would not develop ent until the environment had been free of disturbance for quite a long time. In between these two stages, there's a whole spectrum of other organisms, but one of the important transitional kinds of organisms would be the uh, emergent sessile and sedentary epifauna, things like pen shells, bryzoans, um, scallops that might live on the surface of the sediment, worms like diapetra that have worm tubes. 
things that sort of create some initial stable structure on the bottom that then other organisms can attach to and intertwine with and that sort of will lead up eventually to the case strategists colonizing and taking over that area so th these sort of uh, intermediate stage habitat stabilizers are an important group that's sort of between the R strategists and the K strategists. These pictures show the stages of succession in the sea bottom community off of Antarctica and you see it going from a muddy bare bottom in the upper left hand corner to a bottom that's covered in some small emergent sessile organisms in the upper right hand then in the lower left hand you've got some more heavily developed larger sessile organisms and in the lower right hand you have a large community of sponges that's dominating this environment what would be the disturbance in this Antarctic seabed environment? Yeah, I'll give you a hint it's not a man-made disturbance because this is a relatively protected area the disturbance in the Antarctic benthos is actually scour from the bottom of icebergs. So when chunks of the Antarctic ice sheet break off, they become icebergs. And they look large above water, but they're even larger below water. And when they drift over relatively shallow places of the continental shelf, they scrape the life off the bottom, sort of resetting it back to a bare mud bottom. There are some human effects on the seabed that are just as destructive as being scraped by an iceberg, and that can be seen in this contrast of pictures from an untrawled area of deep sea reef and an area of deep sea reef that has just been destroyed by having a trawl net dragged over it. After a trawl net is dragged over the seabed, there are different stages of succession. Immediately, with all the dead and stirred up organisms, scavengers move in and they eat the dead. And then the scavengers leave and you begin to have some recolonization, first by small microorganisms, myofauna, little invertebrates like worms and amphipods. And those things don't need a stable environment. They can uh, burrow into the sediment. And they're the R strategists that first begin to recolonize. And then some of the organisms that can contribute to habitat formation, like worms that make tubes or, or scallops that make shells that other organisms can settle on, begin to accumulate in the environment. And that sort of creates more stable substrate with more attachment places, which are um, taken up by structure forming organisms like sponges, corals, and sea fans that now have a place to attach. And you begin to sort of regrow the seabed community that you would have had before trawling, which is dominated by these uh, slow-growing sessile epibenthic species. How long does it take? Uh, well, check out that article there. It turns out, in some cases, it takes a very, very long time. One of the interesting ways that humans have to study succession is looking at what happens to artificial reefs, hard substrates artificial substrates that are placed into the environment and are then slowly colonized by living organisms. So there's a sculpture named Jason DeCares Taylor and he has these very lifelike human sculptures that he puts in the ocean in various places and then watches as they are encrusted over by life. And the structures are not cleaned off of the life, they're allowed to go through these successional stages because that's part of the art. His sculptures have an interesting domestic feel. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the statement made by this one is. It's interesting to see some of the organisms that are the first colonizers of bear substrate in the Caribbean. The fire coral Millipore alsicornis, which is actually um, hydrozoan, is a relatively early colonizer compared to other coral. And so fire coral is often found growing on artificial hard substrates in the Caribbean, including these sculptures. This is a time lapse of different pictures of the same sculpture as it's colonized by different organisms over time. There is an important theory relating disturbance to diversity, and it's called the Intermediate Disturbance Hypothesis, first articulated by Joe Connell. 
The idea is that, as you would expect, there's less diversity in highly disturbed environments. That's because few species can tolerate intense and frequent disturbances. What's less intuitive about this theory is that there's also reduced diversity in environments that are very rarely disturbed. The reason for low diversity in environments that are rarely disturbed is that in those environments, certain competitively dominant species are able to take over and exclude the other species. This is similar to what happens in rocky intertidal environments where mussels take over and exclude other species when there's no predation from the Pisaster sea stars. Uh, but it's just that it could be any kind of disturbance, uh, physical factor. It doesn't necessarily have to be a predator doing the disturbance in this hypothesis. Um, so between these two extremes, too much disturbance and not enough disturbance, uh, there's an intermediate level of disturbance, and that's where diversity is maximum because the um, competitively dominant species are uh, kept at bay somewhat, keeping some opportunities open for the earlier successional species to persist, and you have the coexistence of the R-selected species that first colonize a disturbed environment and the K-selected species that uh, you know, ultimately become the competitive dominance. The intermediate disturbance hypothesis is best applied to an environment that's comprised of a mosaic of successional stages. Uh, that being the idea that disturbances are not uniform throughout the entirety of the environment, but that patches of the environment may be disturbed and other patches of the environment disturbed at other times, so that different patches of the environment are have gone different lengths of time since their last disturbance, and therefore have different communities of species ranging from the R-selected species in recently disturbed environments to the K-selected species in environments that haven't been disturbed for a long time. And having this sort of patchwork of environments that have been recently disturbed and environments that have not gives you a greater overall diversity of the region, which we call gamma diversity, than if the entire region was at the same successional stage. Let's talk about the idea I mentioned earlier that, dis that recovery after a disturbance doesn't necessarily take you all the way back to the kind of ecosystem that you started with. Sometimes after a disturbance, the ecosystem will shift into an alternative state. And that especially happens if it's a really bad disturbance, and it especially happens if there have been underlying environmental factors that have been changing a little bit to favor another ecosystem type. So maybe it was a forest, but the climate's been getting a little hotter and drier, and then after a forest fire that breaks down the forest, it turns into like a desert community instead of growing back into a forest because uh, it was sort of heading in that direction anyways, and then once you lost that stabilizing factor of the forest, it could never reform itself. That's sort of what happened in the Mediterranean countries like Greece and Italy, where in the times of the ancient classical civilizations like the Greeks and Romans, there were a lot of forests, and after the forests were cut down in that arid environment, they never really recovered. Uh, it's shifted to an alternative state, which is more of a shrubby, desert-like environment. Um, the tipping point is a phrase that's often used to um, describe this idea that uh, once you disturb an ecosystem beyond a certain amount, then it's no longer maintaining itself in that state that it was in before, and that's one of the things that would allow it to shift. So this concept is also called hysteresis. It's the idea that ecosystems are sort of self-sustaining, and if you severely disturb or damage an ecosystem, it may no longer be able to sustain itself and may sort of flip into an alternate state. Hysteresis can be seen in some seagrass beds where seagrass is resistant to disturbance up to, or resistant to environmental stress up to a point because of positive feedbacks that the seagrass has on itself. Basically, where there's established seagrass, it makes the environment better for continued seagrass growth and survival. Uh, 
So the in stress level in the environment due to pollution or whatever the other stress is can be increasing and increasing and you don't see much change in the seagrass beds until you get to a point where the seagrass just can't handle it anymore and then there's a major loss of seagrass. Once you go over that cliff and have the major loss of seagrass, then those self-sustaining forces of the established seagrass are no longer there and simply reducing the stress a little bit doesn't bring the seagrass back. You have to reduce the stress level quite a bit uh, before it gets to the level where the seagrass can recover, uh, or you have to do some kind of intervention where you restore or replant patches of seagrass to sort of get it back to that level where it can begin sustaining itself and withstanding the environmental stress better again. What might be some of those mechanisms that the seagrass bed has that uh, help it sustain itself, which would be lost when the seagrass is severely disturbed? Well, one of the things that seagrass can do is slow down water movement and cause particles to settle out of the water, clarifying the water. So water clarity within a large seagrass bed, which is baffled by the many blades of seagrass, will be better than water clarity in an area where there's not seagrass on the bottom. Also, the seagrass prevents sediments from being stirred up, and that also keeps the water clear. So when there's seagrass, the water will be clear, and that helps maintain the seagrass. When you lose a lot of the seagrass, the water clarity can decrease because all the sea bottom sediments are being stirred up and not settling out of the water, and then that makes it really hard for seagrass to return to that environment. So it's one of these situations where you just really don't want to lose it in the first place because once it's gone, it could be very hard to get it back. There are different ways that scientists assess the effects of disturbance. All of them involve statistics. The simplest way to assess the effects of disturbance is to look at the abundance of one particular species that we know how it's sensitive to disturbance. So we usually focus on an indicator species, like one species that we know responds in a certain way to disturbance, and we can look at the abundance of that species uh, in relation to disturbance to see how much the environment is suffering or how well it's doing. So we can compare how much seagrass there was before a disturbance versus after a disturbance, for example, and <clears throat> we could compare if the disturbance was spatially um, heterogeneous, we could compare the amount of the indicator species in the disturbed part of the environment versus the undisturbed part of the environment to see how much of a difference there was. In this picture here, the turtle grass, Thalassia testudinum, is one of the indicator species of disturbance, but the scallop is also an indicator of disturbance, and the scallop is actually even more sensitive than the seagrass is. When water quality declines and there are harmful algal blooms, for example, the scallops will die pretty quickly, whereas things might have to get a little bit worse before the seagrass dies. So having multiple organisms be your indicator species is useful because some of them may be more sensitive and can tell you when disturbance is beginning to happen, and others can tell you when disturbance is getting really serious. There are different ways to assess the disturbance levels um, scientifically. One of them is with an experimental approach where you're manipulating the environment, and the other is with a, an observational approach where you're just examining the effects of naturally occurring disturbances. So there are pros and cons of each method. Um, I'll just say a little bit about each method. With the experimental approach, you're artificially creating disturbance, like if you want to test the effects of boat propeller scars in seagrass beds, you could go out and artificially tear up a part of the seagrass bed to create a disturbance, and then you would examine how the disturbance affected the environment and the rates of recovery and things like that. And the nice thing about the experimental approach is that you can do it in a controlled manner where you know exactly when the disturbance happened and you've got a, a undisturbed comparable area 
and you can replicate the disturbance in the control enough times to get statistically reliable data and determine the effects of the disturbance. Sometimes you can't do the experimental approach though because it would be unethical or environmentally destructive to create that artificial disturbance or it's just logistically difficult to simulate that. And in those cases we use an observational approach. So we are doing observations of the environment and we do them before and after the disturbance in areas that were disturbed and areas that were undisturbed. And from the comparisons we can see what the effects of the disturbance are. The problem with the observational approach, one is that you don't always know where and when there's going to be a disturbance and maybe you don't have that before disturbance data. Another problem is that it's hard to distinguish changes that were due to the disturbance itself versus changes that maybe were just going to happen anyways in that habitat. So I'm going to talk about a study design for observational approaches that try to minimize those problems with the observational approach. A before-after control impact study design is the best way to do a uh, test of disturbance effects in an observational manner where you can't properly recreate the disturbance in control treatments. So something like a uh, hurricane, you can't create an artificial hurricane and people would probably complain if you sent an artificial hurricane at them anyways. So um, if you want to study the effects of hurricane disturbance, you need to do it in an observational way and a before-after control impact study design is perfect for that. So it starts out with you picking two, at least two comparable areas, one that was disturbed and the other that was not disturbed. And um, it's a little bit tricky because you have to do this before they're disturbed, or at least you have to have some data from prior to the disturbance, which is one of the reasons that it's good to have regular monitoring programs for the environment anyways. That way, if you've got the monitoring data, then after a disturbance happens, you can go back to the data and see how the disturbance affected it. Uh, so you monitor um, these areas over the same amount of time and one of them is disturbed, the other one's not disturbed. And what that lets you see is if the change, if any changes happened in those environments that were related to the disturbance, they should be detectable only in the environments that were subject to the disturbance and the environments that did not experience the disturbance, um, they may have changed in other ways, but they shouldn't show any change at the time of the disturbance. Okay, so sometimes just looking at one response variable, one indicator species like the seagrass amount or the scallop population, it doesn't tell you uh, enough about the overall change to the ecosystem. Particularly if the ecosystem is diverse and it's made up by many contributing species, you don't just want to know about the change in one species, you want to know how the overall ecosystem has changed or shifted. And so for this kind of ecosystem assessment we use what we call distributional techniques where we look at the number of species in the ecosystem and the number of individuals, the populations in the ecosystem, and, and how they're arranged, like the distribution abundance of organisms within different species. So you've already learned some of these methods. You learned species richness and composition. You learned how to calculate indices of diversity and evenness like the Shannon index and Pilu's index of evenness. And I'm going to teach you two new ways to look at the diversity and abundance of organisms in a community to assess how that community might be changed by disturbance. Those are rank abundance comparisons and abundance biomass comparisons. This is how rank abundance comparisons work. They are organizing the species in the community based in order of their abundance, which is called their rank. So the rank one species is the most abundant species and the nth rank species is the least abundant. So in this community there's about 120 species so the rank goes from 1 to 120, 120 species being the most rare species. And on the y-axis of these rank abundance plots you have the abundance of the species. So you see this 
uh, it's always highest at uh, rank abundance at rank one, of course, and then it uh, decreases in some manner from rank one to the last ranked species. And the slope of this species rank abundance graph tells you something about how evenly distributed the abundance of species is in the community. If, as in this graph, there's a big drop off from the most common species to the more rare species, that means that there's a big disparity in species abundances. That there's some that are very abundant and others that are quite rare. And it would be possible to have a more even community. In fact, this rank abundance line could even be a flat line straight across if all the species were equal in abundance. So looking at the slope of the line and the skew of this graph tells you how um, evenly distributed the abundance of individuals is among the different species in the community. Another cool thing that you can do, or another cool way that you can represent the species rank abundance graph is to keep the same x-axis but use cumulative frequency as the y-axis. So instead of showing the actual abundance of each ranked species, you're showing the proportion of the total number of individuals in the community that are accounted for by that species. So here, the first three species, in, most abundant species in the community account for about 20% of the total individuals in this community, whereas if you include the first 40 most abundant species, you're accounting for about 80% of the total number of individuals in the community. And of course, by the time you've included, you've counted uh, the most abundant all the way down to the most rare species in the community, you've accounted for 100% of the total number of individuals in the community, which is uh, where you get to 1.0 cumulative frequency. And the sort of slope of this graph indicates evenness as well. So if this were a straight diagonal line from one to, from zero to one, um, that would indicate a perfectly even community, whereas uh, a more skewed asymptotic kind of curve indicates that the um, more common species are a lot more common than the rare species. There is a complication to how we rank species and it's, it's that we can rank species based on the number of individuals, which is what the graphs that I've showed you have done, or you can rank species based on collective biomass. So here I'm showing examples with two different species of crabs uh, forming two different populations. And if we rank these two different species by the number of individuals, the green crabs would be number one and the red crabs would be number two. So. Uh, green crabs would be first in rank and red crabs second in rank. But if we rank the species by collective biomass, then we would rank the uh, red crabs first because they're big and they weigh more than the combined weight of the green crabs, even though there's more population of green crabs. So uh, that is important, as we'll see in the next slide, which shows abundance biomass comparison. Let's look at these cumulative frequency or cumulative dominance as it's sometimes called plots to see how these plots of species ranked by their biomass and species ranked by their numbers can tell us something about the characteristics of ecological communities in relation to disturbance, so reconnecting it to disturbance. So in an unpolluted, undisturbed community, you'd expect there to be a lot of large-bodied, long-lived, old, competitively dominant species, things like big trees on a terrestrial environment or big corals in a marine environment. And so that means you'd have a really sort of skewed dominance in terms of biomass with a few of these large-bodied species accounting for most of the dominance in the community. And in graph A, that's what you see. The most abundant or high bi highest biomass species a few species of big corals or sponges or kelps, for example, account for much of the biomass in the community. And the other species um, are, there's a lot of other species, but they don't add that much to the biomass because there's the presence of these large-bodied 
species that really account for the biomass. In terms of numbers, though, there's no one species that's incredibly dominant in terms of numbers, and you have a relatively linear increase in um, cumulative dominance in terms of numbers or counts of individuals among the species, and that's why you see the sort of the different shapes of the cumulative dominance curve for biomass and numbers in the unpolluted community. In the polluted community, you have an opposite trend where because it's recently been disturbed, there's no large, old, long-lived species there, and so there's no species that are contributing disproportionately to the biomass of individuals in the community. There's, um, there are, however, certain small species like weedy, buggy species, little, numerous things that will dominate the numbers of individuals in the community. So the uh, distribution of numbers of individuals in the community is skewed so that the first most abundant um, bugs or weeds are, are really accounting for a lot of the numbers of individuals in the community and uh, you have that being the skewed part of the distribution whereas the biomass numbers uh, it's a more linear increase where uh, there's the species are uh, each species is accounting for a relatively small portion of the biomass in the community. Another way to assess disturbance uh, with multiple species is with multivariate statistics that take into account the abundance of all the different species in the community. And what we can do with these is compare how similar different communities are in their groupings of species and this is most useful when we have sort of a reference area for what species composition and diversity should be like in a healthy community, and another reference for what species composition and diversity should be like in a polluted community. And then we take our community in question and see how similar it is to the polluted reference versus the unpolluted reference in terms of its species composition. And we can make those comparisons graphically with statistical software packages like Primer or there's a free software called R that can make these kind of comparisons. This is a plot showing differences in communities of small animals associated with seagrass beds by different months and different experimental treatments. This was from a seagrass experiment that I did as a postdoctoral researcher at the Smithsonian. And I looked at the composition of the community of life in the seagrass bed over months from June to October and in different experimental treatments in the seagrass bed, including some areas that were caged and some areas that were open to the environment. And what is shown here is that the communities of life were similar within their time periods. So there were changes from June to July, from July to August, from August to October, in terms of what species were present and what abundance. And those differences are reflected in the clustering of these samples within months and the differentiation of the clusters from one month to the next. There were no significant differences in the different experimental treatments, though, which is why you see the control treatment, the partial exclosure treatment, and the exclosure treatment sort of all jumbled together and overlapping within months. So the results of this experiment, where I looked at the multivariate differences in communities, suggested that the disturbance that I was applying to this seagrass bed, basically caging some areas and leaving others open, was not really affecting the community in any way that I could detect, but there was the seasonal change in community composition that was quite obvious. It's really important when you're assessing effects of disturbance that you look at the data over the long term. You need to monitor ecosystems over time and have sort of before and after data for where the disturbances occur or where the other long-term changes occur. And those data sets need to include both biological and abiotic data. 
all the data that you think are going to be important. And it can be challenging to know and include types of monitoring that people in the future are going to be interested in. Hopefully you uh, have the wherewithal to include all the factors that people might want to go back and look at. And then this, this helps to identify the changing conditions, disturbances, and biological responses to whatever disturbances are, are, uh, or long-term changes are happening in the time period that you're looking at. The problem with these long-term data sets is changes in nature are affected by many, many different factors, and there's all kinds of different types of natural variation. So it's tough to know exactly what's causing the various ups and downs and changes that you might see in your data set, but at least it gives you some ideas, and then you can combine this long-term observational approach with strategic experimental approaches that might give you more of a clear idea of what was actually causing those changes that you observed over the long time. Here is one of the world's most famous long-term data sets. It's the global temperature uh, for, from year to year from the 1890s to the present. And you can see there's a lot of variation from year to year. And even so, there's this pretty clear long-term increasing trend in global temperatures. And you probably would not see that trend if you were just looking at a shorter time period, which is one of the reasons that having a long-term data set is very important. Here we're zooming in on a short time period within that long temperature change graph that we were looking at on the last slide. And I cut the time period down to the shorter era from 1935 to 1975 to show how if you're looking at not a full data set but just a short period of time, you might miss these longer trends. It doesn't even look like there's a consistent increasing trend in this period of data, and it's only by looking at, by zooming out a little bit and getting a longer data set that we can see there really is a significant underlying trend here. This emphasizes the need to collect these long-term data sets, and it also sort of cautions against concluding that there's nothing going on just because you didn't detect a trend over a short time period. It might just mean that you're not uh, zooming out enough, so to speak, that you're not looking at a long enough time period to see what the real important ecological changes are. So keep that in mind when you're designing your ecological surveys. All right, that's it for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye.